Uh, let's, uh, let's pray before we get started here. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for the opportunity that we have to come before you and study your word, to lift your name on high, and to worship you. God, I pray that you will bless the words that I have to say. Uh, may they be pleasing to you, and uh, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, hello. Hi. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Daniel. I am the uh, ministry, ministry resident here, which is uh, just a fancy way of saying I'm the intern. Um, but I get to take a break from fetching coffee, and I get to share the Word of God with you today. Um, so before, before we like, dive in, I want to I give you just a quick uh, translation note here. Um, the, the title of this message is A Sheltered Life. Uh, but you're not going to see the word shelter at all in this, uh, in this psalm. Uh, we get that from the, f- the first word of the psalm, preserve me. Um, and I'm kind of a language nerd, so I apologize if this is, this is too much like nerdy stuff for you guys. But um, the word that's used here is, um, it, it carries more of a connotation of protection, of, of guarding, of, of even being sheltered. Um, it's it's the idea of someone standing between you and the thing that is troubling you. Um, so we're going to talk a lot about sheltering. Um, we're going to talk about uh, being a champion um, and how God is, is that for us. Um, so, yeah, the, um, I, I was on Reddit the other day, um, and I, I saw this really interesting story. The Queen of England, Queen Elizabeth has a champion. It, I mean, it's kind of weird. It's, it's 2019, and, and most of the time we use our big boy and big girl words to resolve problems. But still, if somebody were to challenge Queen Elizabeth's uh, right to the throne, they'd have to go through her champion. <laughs> the awesome part about that is her champion is, whoops, that's me. <laughs> her champion is this guy. He is a 64-year-old accountant. Now, I'm not trying to disparage accountants. If if you're an accountant, we love you. You're awesome. We need you. But the phrase, stand back, I'm an accountant, is not really something that strikes fear into the heart of your enemies. (laughs) He's just not quite the type of person that you would think of to be a champion. Now, David, on the other hand, David is your prototypical champion. David is the author of our psalm here. And David, like, I mean, you all know the story of David and Goliath, where he's like a kid, and he goes and he, and he represents the whole nation of Israel, defeats a giant. And I mean, that, that was like his life, whether it was uh, leading the charge into battle or raiding Philistine camps, or even climbing through a sewer to capture a city. David is the prototypical champion for Israel. But here, we see that he is in trouble. He needs a champion. He needs shelter. We don't really know why. Um, the some of the Psalms, like Psalm 51, we know the backstory on uh, that Psalm was written when David was, uh, uh, after he was found out with his, uh, with his affair with Bathsheba. Uh, Psalm 137, we know that that was written by the exiles in Babylon. Um, but, but with this Psalm, we don't really know what the backstory is. So I'm going to make it up. I'm, I'm actually going to give you three stories from the life of David that, uh, that could potentially be the backstory for, for this psalm. The first uh, is when David is a young man, he, uh, he finds himself uh, working as a musician in Saul's court, the king of Israel's court. And uh, if you know the story, you, uh, you start to realize that he's in a bit of a hostile work environment. Uh, as time goes on, Saul starts to get jealous of David and his champion-like acts, and uh, eventually he, uh, he gets so fed up that he throws a spear at him, and the Bible says he literally tried to pin him to the wall. Talk about a hostile work environment. And this happened not once, 
Not even twice, but three times. And, and finally, David found himself on the run. So maybe that is the backstory for this. Or maybe it's uh, when David's son Absalom rebelled against him. At this point, David is the king of, of all Israel. Uh, but his son's like, well, you know, I think it's my turn. And yeah, you get to go away. And so he rebels against his father, drives him out of Jerusalem, and David finds himself on the run. So maybe that's the backstory. Maybe that's why David needs to be sheltered. Or maybe it's a problem of his own making. Uh, at, the, at the very end of 2 Samuel, we, we find a story uh, uh, where David takes a census of the whole country. Now, I don't have time to really go into why God was not super excited about that, but God was definitely not excited about that. And the, the result of David's action is that hundreds and thousands of people died. And so maybe David needs shelter from his own mistakes. And we're going we're gonna to break down his response to that. See, David starts out the psalm with saying, God, shelter me, preserve me, I need your help. But then he just spends the rest of the psalm praising God, which is, it's a little confusing. If he needs help, wouldn't he detail it? Wouldn't he say, God, I need you to do this for me and this for me and this for me? But that's not what David does. In this psalm, David focuses his attention on praise, not on his problem. I'm going to say that again because that's what we're going to look at for the rest of today. David focuses his attention on praise, not on his problem. Now, just as a quick aside, with, uh, with messages like this, it can be really easy to kind of like view this as a formula. Uh, we can look at God as a vending machine where, okay, we put praise in and now I get my solution. Everything is great. That's not how this works. This, this isn't a message about how you can get what you want. This is a message about how we can open ourselves up to receive what God knows that we need. So in verse 2, David says, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good. One, one of the, just the side effects of you know, our English translations is that we see the, the word Lord all the time, everywhere, in, in caps and in regular letters. And, it's a, it, and you can kind of just gloss over it. So I want to retranslate this for you just, just so we can have, make it have a little bit more impact. David says, I say to Yahweh, you are my master. Everything that is good comes from you. And what David is doing here is he's setting himself up under what God has to say. He's, he's setting God as the best, the best thing he can possibly have. And, and as the psalm goes, goes through, he, he, he first praises God for the people in his life, starting with God himself. And then he goes on and praises God for the, the good things that God has blessed him with. And then he finally just, just breaks it down and he just praises God and, and just tells him how awesome he is. But when we focus our praise, or when we focus on praise, we have to first set ourselves under God because everything else that we praise God for comes from him. The next thing he, he lists as something to praise God for are the saints in the land. He says, as for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is my delight. And I want to pause here for a moment because this is really important. I want to, I want to address you uh, all as, as the body, not, not just individual people here, but the body of Calvary. Because I want to tell you that you are the saints in the land. You are excellent, and I delight in you. This is a healthy body. This is a strong body. Not without its flaws, certainly, but 
when Janelle and I first got here, the, the thing that struck us was just how welcoming and warm and loving all of you are. And, and now for, for each of you individually, I want to encourage you, if you find yourself in a, in a situation like David, turn to the saints. We're an excellent tool that God uses to provide shelter. If you find yourself in a situation at work where you're in a hostile work environment, maybe your boss isn't throwing spears at you, but you feel like you're, you're being chased out, you're being, undue pressure is being put on you, and you just, you're going to explode. Turn to the saints. Find people in this wonderful body and share your troubles with them. They're here for you. They love you. Or if you're having trouble with your kids, if they're rebelling against you like, like Absalom did, or if you're a kid and you're having the, the same kind of trouble with your parents, you're frustrated with them, turn to the saints. I can personally guarantee in here that there are other parents in this room right now that have dealt with rebellious children. My parents are here from out of town, and so I can personally guarantee <laughs> that there are parents in here who have dealt with rebellious children. Or if you've made a mistake and people are hurting and it's your fault, it can be so isolating and you can feel so alone. You, you feel like everyone hates you or, or they just would if they knew what you did. But you're not alone. You have the body of Christ here, the saints who are excellent in whom you can delight. We're here for you. Pastor Steve is here for you. Your small group is here for you. I'm here for you. Come talk to someone. The body is here. The body is alive. And friends, that is something we can praise God for. Amen? Yeah. I've always wanted to do that. Thank you. <laughs> In, in verse 4, I don't want to spend a ton of time in verse 4 because, the, like I said, I'm a language nerd, so I looked at this in Hebrew, and it's, it's really complicated. It's really weird. But um, David here is, he is just being really clear that he's really intentional about following God and not other gods. He is making it his intention to stay away from the wrong way, and he's chasing after God. And he's excited about that. That's something to praise God for. But then he, he transitions in verse 5, where he, he starts listing the things that God has given him that he can praise God for. He says, The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. Uh, some of the com one of the commentators that I read on this um, uh, paraphrased it as saying, God, you are my food and my drink. Uh, a couple other commentators uh, translated this passage, Lord, you are my smooth cup of wine. And I just, I want you to picture just the feeling that you get when you sit down at the table after a long day and, and maybe you got some steak and potatoes or, or pan seared fish or something great and you just pour yourself a cup of good Merlot and you just sit back and ah, that is a gift from God and that is something to praise him for. In verse 6, David talks about the lines falling in pleasant places. He's talking about the boundary lines of his family's inheritance, uh, like their farm. When, when the Israelites came in into the, the land, they took uh, the land and, and they divided it up and they put, you know, boundary lines. And David is saying that his land has, has fallen in a great place. Maybe it's by a stream so he can water his crops or more likely he's a shepherd, so maybe it's good grazing land. But David is taking the things that he's been giving and he's listing them out and he's praising God for them. And not only has God given us physical things, but he gives us counsel. He gives us wisdom. 
And that is even more valuable than the stuff he gives us. David blesses God because he gives him counsel. He gives him a heart that instructs him. And he makes sure that he puts God first. And he celebrates that. And finally, in verse 9, David just can't, he can't contain himself anymore. He just, he just starts busting a move. And he's like, my whole being rejoices. Now, you got to remember something about David. David is not a guy who slacks when it comes to celebrating. One of my favorite stories about David is when they bring the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem and David leads the parade and he's celebrating and he's just, he's going so crazy. He just pulls off his clothes and he's just dancing before the Lord in his underwear. <laughs> now, before you guys start like writing emails to Pastor Steve, that, that intern that you put up there is telling me to dance around in my under... I'm not saying. But when it comes to celebrating God, don't let anything hold you back, even your clothes. David is excited about what God has done for him. Now, with all this talk about praise, it can be easy to think that when we praise God, all of our problems will be solved, right? That, that vending machine idea. And I have to admit, I've kind of been making it sound like that. But I think that you're all smart enough to know that that's, that's not really true. Like, for example, Janelle has a, uh, a big, huge test coming up. She has to take a licensure exam so that she can practice as a psychologist. Now, she can praise God all she wants. She can dance and sing and shout, but at the end of the day, she's still going to have to take that test. And if she doesn't work hard and if she doesn't study, she's not going to pass it. It doesn't matter how much she praises God. But that's not really the point. If you're, if you're having trouble at work or at home or, or with something that, that you did, it's not going to go away just because you praise. Way back in verse 1, David asks for shelter, but here in the second part of verse 9, he comes to a realization. He says, God, protect me. Oh, but wait. My whole being rejoices because my flesh already, or my flesh also dwells secure. The word dwells is really important here because it's in the present tense. It's current. It's now. David's not saying, once you shelter me, God, then my flesh will dwell secure. Once you answer my prayer, once I'm done praising you, David's saying, no, right now, before the words left my mouth, I was already secure. David knows that he is currently already delivered. And the good news is, so are you. You are already delivered. Before the words left your mouth, God knew what it was that you needed protection from. And he already delivered you. Isn't that awesome? But okay. Really, Daniel, you say. Daniel, that's not true. Like, come on. If David was already delivered, why bother with all of this stuff? What is the point of praise? And furthermore, I'll have you know, I am not delivered. I am not fit. There, my problem is not fixed. I still have trouble at work. I still have trouble at home. I still messed up and people are still hurting. Praise does not seem like the solution here. And honestly, yeah, you're right. 
that praising God is not going to change a single thing in the outside world. Not one thing. So why are we spending all this time talking about praise when it really doesn't change anything? It really doesn't fix anything out there. Well, praise isn't supposed to fix what's out there. Change isn't, or praise isn't supposed to change your problem. Praise is supposed to change you. When we praise God, it doesn't change our problems. It changes our hearts. How does it do that? Well, let's look at verse 11. David says, you make known to me the path of life. Now, to us in 2019, living in Colorado, we might look at that phrase and say, oh, yeah, the path of life. That's the spirit inspiring David to, to talk about uh, eternal life, the, the life that we'll get forevermore because we, we trust in God. And yeah, looking at the, at the Bible as a whole picture through the lens of Jesus as New Covenant Christians, yeah, that is absolutely right. But to David and the people who, who were his contemporaries, this is a shepherding metaphor. I want to show you a picture. This is, I'll go over here. This is a picture I took when I was in Israel, um, just a few miles south of Bethlehem. This is the grazing land that David would have taken his sheep through. In a couple of weeks, we'll talk about Psalm 23. Um, this is the green pasture. Not, not very green, right? But I don't want to steal the thunder of uh, whoever's preaching that passage. Uh, what I want you to focus on right now are the little discolored lines running horizontally across the screen. They're really, really faint. And you, if you can't see them, that, that's fine. That's kind of the point. Um, now, I kind of outline them for you a little bit here. And if you look at them, they're just like stare really hard, and then I go back, you can kind of start to see him, right? Or if I do this, then you can, you can really start to see these little, these lines. Now, I skipped a part. Uh, look at the bottom of the picture there with all of those rocks. Those, those rocks are really, really loose, and the whole hillside, the whole countryside, is filled with these loose rocks. And I mean, it was dangerous for me to walk on it, and I was, I was wearing my hiking boots, and I'm semi-intelligent about where I put my feet. For a sheep, those loose rocks are dangerous. If a sheep steps on that and, and slips, it breaks its leg, it's done. It can't walk to new gra grazing areas. As you can see, it needs to walk a lot to find grass. But those rocks are everywhere except for those little lines. Those little lines on the screen are literally paths of life. When David says, you make known to me the path of life, he's saying, you literally are shepherding me and you show me where to walk so I won't die. And that's what praise does. Praise doesn't solve our problems. Praise doesn't fix the thing that we have to worry about. Praise focuses our attention on the good shepherd. Praise is what allows, uh, allows us to look up and see Jesus. The thing that I love about David is that he does such a good job of pointing a thousand years ahead to his descendant, Jesus Christ. Jesus is our good shepherd, and he is the one who shows us the way to life. And just like I used Photoshop to show you those little paths of life, Jesus uses praise to show us the path of life. 
When we fix our eyes on Jesus, he is able to direct our attention to the way to go. And again, it's not going to solve your problem. But you're still going to have to face whatever it is that you're facing, your job, your family, the problem that you cause yourself, or, or whatever it is that you are asking God for deliverance from, you're still going to have to face it. But the good news is you have a champion. And that's me again. Your champion is not a 64-year-old accountant. Your champion is the king of the universe. Your champion is God Almighty, and whatever it is you have to face, you get to face it with God. Jesus says, because of my sacrifice on the cross, I have conquered the thing you need deliverance from. I have walked this path of life already, and I came back for you, and I'm going to walk it with you. When we focus on praise and not on our problems, it gives God the opportunity to show us the path of life. And that's my prayer for you. Whatever it is you're seeking shelter from, whatever you need a champion to face, focus on praise, not on your problem. Because God's going to bring you through it. He's going to be at your side. We just have to focus on him. And when we focus on praise, the rest of verse 11 comes to life. When we walk the path of life with Jesus, we'll find that in his presence, there is the fullness of joy. And at his hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Let's pray.